Okay. All right, so I'll just kind of kick this off then. I'll back raising Islander eight. I mentioned this earlier uh, in kind of my overview presentation. So representing Isle is is us. I'm I'm Danny Lamb, tech lead. Nigel. I'll introduce Nigel. That's fine. Long-standing community member, all around nice guy, doing a ton of work, wrote a whole bunch of this stuff. He's very knowledgeable. So Isle's history. I'll start it out in Islandora 7. It was uh, a Mellon Grant funded project. It's ongoing, although it's kind of, you know, ramping down, I guess, like all the Islandora 7 stuff. Um, it has had 10 releases to date. And so this is uh, a project that the ICG applied for with the Mellon funding and got. Um, and so it's all, it was all kind of in-house there for them. Um, we kind of tried to take it all kind of as one one giant ball when all of the development was done, but that turned out to be really tricky. And so what we ended up doing instead was when um, Islandora 8 rolled around, we decided instead that we would just take the Isle project and this time, instead of it being done off on the side and contributed back the whole time, it would just be done as a community project and kind of subject to the community rules. So the ICG crowdfunded the Islandora 8 development for Isle. And this thing is brand spanking new. Um, it is hot off the presses. And really what's, what separates, you know, from seven and eight, I mean, we'll get into the technical details of it, but from a community point of view, it's really, it's the collaboration. Islander eight's aisle is really a collaboration between um, all the members of the ICG, um, myself at the Islandora Foundation, uh, uh, Nigel and Lyricis, but then also Born Digital. So we have like several vendors at play here. We have the foundation at play here. We have several, you know, stakeholders from various institutions at play here. And so this is really turning out to be much more of a shared environment, which is really kind of the idea behind all of this. Um, but it's just, that's really coming to fruition now, really more than ever. So uh, why Docker? I guess that's really the, what's the point of all this? We've already done um, Ansible uh, playbooks and wrapped it up with Vagrant so you could create a development environment. Why would you spend your time working with this? Um, and the answer, anyone who's dealt with the Ansible stuff long enough, I think they'll know, but um, the answer is kind of multi-pronged, but it's all, it's all good. So if you look at this, this is essentially the architecture diagram. This is my obligatory architecture diagram for the, for the conference. I always have to display one. This one was actually made by uh, Bethany Seeger, one of our wonderful community members. And she actually gets like a special, uh, a special gold prize for, I think, making the most relatable and understandable diagram of the stack to date, which is this. Um, it still looks like a lot. Well, that's because Islandora is a lot. And so like the number one reason for going with Docker is that there's a lot of microservices. You got to manage all of that stuff and doing all of it as containers uh, is pretty easy. I kind of said like if you take the thought of microservices and the architecture of Islandora 8 all the way come to the end of the line, this is, this is where you wind up. Um, Another one is that it is blazingly fast. I mean that in sense of it is fast in how it serves the site and when you're you know, interacting with it, but it's also super fast for the people that are working with it. It means that I have a much shorter turnaround time if I have to blow away my environment and create a new one. What used to be 45 minutes to an hour is now maybe three minutes, something like that. It's crazy fast. You can change up everything, redeploy all your config and test a new provision within minutes uh, as opposed to within hours. And, and also it's, it's automatable. So already we're doing some minor automation with it at the foundation. We're going to expand on that later and improve it. Uh, eventually you're gonna see the sandbox basically get brought up into all of this automation and stuff like that. But um, because it's so fast, then it's also pretty quick and easy to automate and to integrate with things like Travis um, or GitHub Actions. So I mentioned that it was super fast. 
Um, one of the reasons why it is super fast, well, the reason why it is super fast is because it uses an experimental feature in Docker called BuildKit. And so um, very quickly, I'll try to explain this. Yet again, this is another trope that keeps getting passed around our community. Um, the best way to think of it is like onions and onions have layers. And normally if you go change something at like the core central layer, then Docker would have to rebuild everything as it goes out to all the outer layers. Um, what BuildKit does is it essentially, it caches all of those layers. And then if you change a base one, it's smart enough to know what's affected and what's not. And the things that aren't affected, it just pulls from the cache. So it goes crazy fast. So you can change a core feature that affects literally every single container, but even then, not all the layers are gonna get changed. And so you can still rebuild the whole thing within you know, a couple of minutes, basically. All right, so I'll back off here and let Nigel kind of talk about everything here in BuildKit. Nigel, you're muted. Am I good now? Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Uh, so yeah, I, I'll build kit contains all the Docker images that are used by Isle. They're all built with Gradle. Um, at the very base layer, we share as much as possible as we can across all of the images. So they're all built on the same base image, which is built on Alpine Linux. It's super small, about five megabytes. It's the smallest Linux with a package manager that's available. It's a little bit different than you know, Ubuntu or what have you, because it's built on Muse libc rather than libc. You know, this is really sort of low level thing. But because of that, you know, there's occasionally packages and things that you won't find in Alpine that would be readily available in Ubuntu. When that sort of thing happens, we have a, a system set up where we can build like a custom image like we do for image magic. Uh, so there's like the ability to bring in new packages and things into the system as well. Uh, what we do at the base level we, we uh, pack in an S6 overlay as a process manager, so you can run multiple services within a single Drupal container. It has some other unique features around it as well, but uh, the main reason we do this is sort of an organizational structure. Uh, and then on top of that, we also have a ConfD, which we use for configuration management. So uh, with Docker, you would bring in some sort of runtime differences or uh, changes in functionality through environment variables or secrets or something like this. And so we take that information with ConfD and then we can render out like PHP config files that have the appropriate information. Like I wanna start up PHP and have a max number of 128 processes that can run because I have a really big box. Someone else has a smaller box, they can only run say 16, so they would change that variable. And whenever they start up, they would get the appropriate PHP init file. Uh, it's since it's built on Gradle, it's all cross-platform. You can build all the build and run all the containers on Windows, uh, OS X, and Linux. Uh, and we we ended up building our own sort of customized plugin for Gradle that resolves all the uh, dependencies between all the images, and uh, that's available as a plugin. So if you want to extend or use this same setup in your own project with your customized images, you can do that fairly easily. Okay, I guess I guess I'll take this slide here. You know, I'll hand it back to you, Nigel, here shortly. Um, so there's BuildKit. Uh, I mentioned that we do some automation. Every time that a commit rolls through in BuildKit, uh, after it's merged in, then a GitHub action fires off. It runs Gradle. It builds the whole suite of images, and then it pushes all of them to, Doc to Docker Hub. So you can go to Docker Hub right now. We have the Islandor organization. You can see all the images that are there. There's like 25 in total. Some of those are intermediate though. So we just use them during the build process. And so um, by default, if you were to spin on the site, it's, it's 19 different images or containers that are running to run all of your aisle. But, but it's all automated. It's always there. Everything is tagged as the latest. So if you want the latest, you can always just pull that and you know you're getting the, the latest and greatest. And then here, I'll pass it back to Nigel. If you want to use these images, you would use this. Yeah, so you, there's no mechanism for actually running the images inside of 
our build kit, all the, the mechanism for orchestrating, which is starting up and running the containers and having them communicate with each other is done on our DC. DC stands for Docker Compose. So the way this uh, repository works is basically there's a make file, which will then look at your configuration that you say, like, I want you to include this, I want you not to include this, and I want to set these environment variables on that particular container or service. And then run make, it'll generate you a Docker Compose file, which you can then use to bring up all of the containers and have them communicate with each other, what have you. Um, so for the networking, and the, we have an edge router called traffic, which does all the conversion between what you ask for at the URL level in your browser to which container to redirect that particular request to. Uh, it's zero configuration. So if you were to like do locally and you bring up some site, you'll get islandora dash ildc.traffic.me and you don't have to modify your accept host file or anything. You just pop into the browser and see it essentially right away. Uh, and we use another external uh, image called Watchtower, which will automatically reload Docker images if they change. So the workflow for developers in general will be something like have build kit running, use Gradle continuous so that it builds all the time. The second they modify a Docker file or add a file into one of the containers, that would then rebuild. And then as soon as it's ready, Watchtower would take that image and then replace it in the running configuration that was started by Docker Compose. So it's sort of like you just work and things automatically pop up when they're ready and done. You don't have to think, oh, I need to go stop and go run all this. Just have it run in the background for you. Yeah, I have to, I'll have to admit, I am, I'm minorly in love with that workflow there. Uh, it is, it's fantastic for a, a developer point of view. Um, so use cases, what could you use aisle for? So we have three kind of basic use cases that we are, we are meeting at various stages here. So uh, you can use it to spin up a demo of Islandora real fast, like as fast as you can download the images. Um, it will spin up and you'll get a demo site up and running within minutes. Um, you can also do local development. You can, you know, give Islandora, give Isle your code base, you know, your composer file for your project with all of your modules, stuff like that. Um, and you can create a development environment or like a staging environment, something like that. Um, and then you can run what I'm calling like a small instance um, safely in the wild. So you can do a small production instance. This is not some um, crazy cool auto scaling, you know, thing running on Kubernetes. This is, you can take that same Docker Compose project, put it on a remote machine and run it. And at least you can run it over HTTPS. So you know, you can do it safely and, and people that are looking at your site aren't subject to the man in the middle attacks or anything like that. But, but that's where we're at. So you can, you can check it out, you can work on it and you can actually run a small site with it. And it does so in a way that's actually safer and further along than our Ansible playbooks ever were. And so if you do want to spin up a demo, which I suggest you try, um, you can clone down aisle DC, pull it down. And then once you're there, it's two commands. You type make, it will generate, look at all your config and it will generate um, your Docker compose files and everything. And then you start it by saying docker compose up dash D and it will actually spin everything up. And then you just go uh, to the URL, which I'm going to put into this slide when we're done here because it, it needs to be there, but it is islandora-ildc.traffic.me. And we use that traffic.me. Um, it's essentially like saying localhost, but it's like saying localhost and it lets us use HTTPS and a couple things to mimic production better. So it's, it's pretty, pretty quick, pretty easy to get, to, to get going. Um, I think it's a really solid product. I am going to be like migrating our sandbox over to it and stuff like that. It's certainly ready for my purposes. However, it is still very, very new. And so like looking forward, what we need to do here, uh, we need better documentation. I mean, that, that just like, check you know like anytime you're talking about open source software we always need that but it's true we need better documentation um hopefully as i go through the process of 
moving and migrating the sandbox over to Isle, we can start to um, document and discuss workflows. Workflows of taking your content from you know, dev to staging to production, how you keep that state safe, maybe, how you would spin up a testing server with some sample of the data and stuff like that. And all of this is like possible right now. It's just, it's just not described or documented. You know, we just got to work through it and, 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 and explain it to people. Um, and, and then lastly, more orchestrations. So we do Docker Compose right now, uh, which is great for small stuff. There's certainly lots of tools around Docker Compose and there's vendors that are getting, um, building tooling around it too, to make things easier for you. But there are uh, other things out there. Kubernetes is really what I'm talking about, sort of. It won the orchestration war with Docker containers. It is the de facto standard now for running stuff in prod if you need to essentially auto scale based on various conditions. That's really what it does. And so we would love, as folks start doing that and running their production instances in it, we would love to be able to share examples of these orchestrations or documentation around how to do these orchestrations so that you just have more options for running it. And, and on top of that, not just running Kubernetes, but then all the individual vendors have their own flavors of stuff. And it would just be nice to say, hey, here's how you run it on, you know, DigitalOcean or AWS or Microsoft Azure or something like that. So we have about one minute left. So I will just go ahead and end there, but just say thanks for everyone for, for listening to us here. And if you have any questions, I'm, Nigel and I are glad to field them. First question is, how plausible is it to run aisle eight in a multi-site setup, i.e. one Fedora container, one solar container, multiple Drupal sites? I've tried to run aisle seven as a multi-site and it's proven difficult. Okay, hi Brandon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, I guess ask Nigel about that. So I know it's in the works. I know it's part of Lyricist's plan for aisle eight, but I'll, I'll defer to him to let you know just how far along it is. Uh, so at the moment we're running without Fedora just to get everything up and running and because we're more focused on doing a migration into Drupal at the moment, but we have multi-sites working with Drupal in this setup. So basically uh, the way it works is you have environment variables for defining how to bring up your site, like my site name, the URL, um, what the password is for the root user. And then you just define again, another set of variables for the other sites you want to create. And there's a little bit in the documentation about that. So you can spin up as many Drupal sites as you want inside of it. The trickier bit is like with Fedora, right? So like there's namespacing, but also maybe you want to separate it out into different actual instances of Fedora. And, you know, I just, I haven't got that all working yet. It seems fine on a single instance. Um, 